So uh, here the, the committee of the guidelines, the writing committee is there, so if you have any criticism, please um, ask questions. So uh, here are my disclosures. And this is the, the first page of the document which was published both in European Journal and European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. And you see that this effort was uh, conducted by Ottavio Alfieri with here and myself plus a group of, of friends. And I should say that the atmosphere was always excellent and we, we felt that adding uh, experience is a real plus for, you know, for digging the evidence and at the end making some recommendations. We didn't write anything into marble. We proposed recommendations to the colleagues. So uh, I'm going to address mostly patient evaluation in order to avoid too many redundancies with the following speakers. Well, uh, we already wrote a document in 2007 but it was only a cardiologist. And uh, since 2007, a couple of new things appeared in the literature, even in the field of heart disease, on risk stratification, on diagnostic method, and also uh, new therapeutic options came up, mostly TAVI. But the most important thing is probably sec to TAVI, but also sec to what was written and what happened in coronary vascularization. The concept of herd team was put forward, and really this collaboration between the surgeons and cardiologists appeared to be key. So who are the members of the heart team um, as regards valve disease? should be a group of valve specialists. So you don't take someone without experience, which may occur uh, among cardiologists, and you put them together. And they have to collaborate, not to sit like that, but to collaborate and uh, select the best procedure for the patient, work together to perform, and work together to evaluate the results. Here is a scheme of the heart team. You always do have the surgeons and the cardiologist. We do need, for most procedures, the anesthesiologist. We should be cardiac anesthesiologists. Imaging specialists should be on board. And it's quite easy, and we are used to work with echocardiographists, sometimes more difficult with radiologists, but we have to include them in this effort. And we need also other specialists, could be geriatrician, neurologist, etc. So here is a hard team. There is not a unique recipe for organizing the work of the hard team. Should be individualized, but should be there. So here are the steps. We should move forward slowly from one step to the other. When we are discussing, when we are evaluating a patient, when discussing an operation intervention. The first question is to know if the valve disease is severe. So uh, this group decided to adopt the European Association of Echocardiography recommendation. And the key message is when you evaluate severity, echo is the main, uh, exam the main tool, but you should use the data from echo on an integrative way. For example, for arctic stenosis, Valvaria is good, but it's not sufficient. There should be results from gradient, from maximum velocity, which are coherent, concordant with the valve area measurement. So integration for stenosis, integration also for regurgitation. We need anatomic data to show us a mechanism, and we need also quantification. And clearly among the group, there were several echocardiographists, and everybody agreed on the fact there is no magic number. You should not send a patient to surgery because the EROA is uh, 0.41 only. You should send the patient if you have clinical signs or left ventricular consequences, if you have a mechanism, if you have an EROA which is over the threshold, but not an EROA alone. Then we discuss the other exercise, uh, testing, for example, useful when you doubt about the symptoms, stress echo, somewhat difficult to do, but could be useful. MRI, very interesting, especially for the aorta and the right ventricle. CT, MSCT is there, of course, for the aorta and for TAVI. Cardiac cast, you should never use cardiac cast to evaluate severity if echo is available, if echo is of good quality. 
On the other hand, coronary angio, nothing really new. Coronary angio should be largely used before um, valve surgery because most of our patients are over 40 years of age. That is a crucial exam part of the work. The next good question which comes to us is to know if the patient has symptoms or not, and perhaps more importantly, if the symptoms are related to the valve disease. If you have doubt about the symptoms, please exercise the patient. It's not risky if they are asymptomatic. Exercise them. In the elderly patients, or in the patients with comorbidity like COPD, it's sometimes difficult to know if the symptoms are related to the heart or to the other disease. Please consult with pneumologist. Please speak carefully with the patient. The timing of the symptoms could help a lot. Then we have to know what is the patient's life expectancy and expected quality of life. And here we have tables from Europe. Here uh, a proposal from the Working Group on Valve Disease, which was recently published by Raphael Rosenheck. And you can see the expected life expectancy according to the gender in men. And uh, unfortunately, in men, it's much shorter than in women. And it's grossly the same in Europe and in the US. Then we have to evaluate the life expectancy, and we have scores. Scores mostly coming from geriatricians, and it's very helpful. And also, we have to carefully evaluate the quality of life, which is possible, which is expected by the patient. The next question, which is extremely important, is to know what is the risk benefit of intervention. Because the problem is, the cardiologist only, very often, only consider the risk of surgery, forgetting that in patients who are at high risk for surgery, the natural history is catastrophe. So here, when assessing the risk of a patient before intervention, we have to be very careful and know what is the natural history of the disease and also what is the expected risk of the intervention. As regards the um, reasons for not sending the patient to surgery and somewhat denial of the natural history, I'd like to briefly quote one study, which was the best oral presentation during the last ESC. It's coming from Spain, and they perform a very interesting registry uh, in several, several centers, looking at all the patients over 80 with severe aortic stenosis seen in these centers. And you can see that in almost half of the cases, management was conservative. And the predictors for non-surgical management were the age of the patient. It's not about a good reason not to operate a patient because he's 90. CATS index, it is frailty. It could be a good reason not to operate a patient who cannot move. High Euroscore could be a good reason. Low ejection fraction could be debatable not to operate because the ejection fraction is low. Low gradient could also be debatable. So you see we have half of the patient with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who still are not considered for surgery. So there is still a lot of work to be done. The risk scores we have, you know them, mostly Euroscore, STS score. They are very good in terms of discrimination, separating low from high risk, but they are very poor in terms of calibration, and there is a difference between predicted and observed risk, especially in the high-risk cohort. Euroscore won't really change the game. So what did we conclude in the group? We said that in the absence, in the absence of perfect quantitative score today, we should mostly rely on the clinical judgment of the heart team. So it's an important decision to put the clinical judgment of the heart team on top of everything. Of course, we should not send the baby with the water of the bath, and we can keep, we can keep the scores, but it's only a sort of second rank in our reasoning. Now uh, we have to work, and the Working Group on Valve Disease wrote this very interesting paper recently published in European Heart Journal, considering the future model for prediction of surgery or of TAVI for aortic stenosis. And here are a couple of requirements, and we have to work on it. We have to work on a model for surgery, but also we have to work on a model for TAVI, and it's not there yet. 
The second thing, the second big part when we are discussing the risk is to assess the long-term consequences of intervention. And here we have, it's, in these documents, there is a plead in favor of performing durable mitral repair. It means you should learn how to do that and we have to define it to create expert centers for mitral repair. And then we have also to try to dim and at least educate our patients as regard prosthetic related complications. The last two things are what are the patient wishes and what are the local resources optimal for planned intervention. Here, it's a plea for expert center for mitral repair and also expert center to create expert center for arctic valve repair. And there is here a lot of work to be done. The patient wishes. Let's come back to Spain. And they asked to the patients why don't, you, why don't you want to have uh, surgery? And uh, to the cardiology story, why don't you want to send your patient to surgery? You see that many felt uh, the patients were very high risk, but you see a sizable number of patient refusal, 20% of family refusal. And here we have to work on it. And really, if a patient refused to undergo surgery, it should be addressed by the heart team, and after a good heart team discussion with the patient, very often the patient will change his mind. On the other hand of the spectrum, patient wishes could be at risk in the domain of TAVI. And here you see the findings in several registries. In the German TAVI registry, 13% of the patient decision led to perform TAVI. And the German colleague said it is alarming. In France, this proportion is even higher. And what is really alarming is that the percentage is increasing over time. It's almost 17% of the patient receive TAVI because they want it. And that's not good. It should not be done. And we have to fight against that. And the way to fight against that was summarized by Peter recently. We have to come up with good evidence. That's why the Surtavi trial is on its way in Europe and the partner too is on its way in the US. So dear colleagues, dear friends, to conclude from this introductory talk to the guideline presentation, the real key concept is a hard team, a real hard team, no single recipe, but a collaboration of all these um, physicians to allow a patient-centered, multidisciplinary decision-making. Clinical evaluation should still play a key role in a decision in the evaluation of patients with valve disease. ECHO is the most important investigation to help us, but no magic number. We have to integrate all the findings and check their consistency within ECHO data and between the ECHO data and a clinical assessment. And finally, we need to refine a risk evaluation and always think balance between the risk and the benefit of intervention. This may appear quite uh, simple to a surgical audience, but it is a real problem for the medical audience. We have to teach our colleagues to do that. And here, the most important player is a judgment of the heart team together with a risk score, which have to be improved. So the last slide is to show you that if you want more information about these guidelines, you can come, of course, to ESCTS side, but to ESC side, guideline side, where you find the full text, the essential messages, the pocket, the slide set, and some CME question if you want to play when you are at home. So thank you for attention. <laughs>